Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is Crippen's Pipe. They were all finally situated around the fire pit in the twilight. No one had gotten injured so far, so that was a success. It was easier these days, now that they were adults. Getting them all corralled around the fire had taken some time. It had always taken some time, all the way back to when they were children. In those days it had been their parents who did the corralling. Now, it was up to them, or, specifically, Ginny. If they had changed some, the yard behind the cabin that they all knew so well had not changed at all. The forest still encroached all around. Tall, dark pines, the jumbled shadows of the undergrowth. Overhead, the wheel of the northern constellations were becoming visible, no different than when they'd been children. Orion, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. Beyond the crackling of the flames and the mysterious, rustling sounds of the woods, there was an immense quiet for the city dwellers grouped around the fire. Only the muted, yellow light coming from the cabin windows gave a sign of civilization. Which was just as well. For the Marchese family children, that light, the lumpy but adequate beds, the flushing toilets, were the only thing that held the annual trip together. As children they hadn't cared about such things, but as adults they'd become delicate, accustomed to comfort. They had run through the woods like animals as children, slept in the bunk beds with their musty mattresses, caught toads and tiny, angry crayfish in the lake, discovered secret places, tumbled down hills, treated each other's cuts and scrapes. They had been close, at least for a week or two each summer, but time had scattered them. Approaching adulthood, these children that shared cabin's owners, the three sisters and one brother, who had played so many games together, invented so many adventures, had lost an excuse to go back, until Ginny saved them. Ginny May, Robert and Christine's daughter, first child, special education teacher, redhead, all-around pesterer, self-appointed keeper of the flame, had come up with a plan. Once a year, to lure them all back in adulthood, she hosted a themed weekend at the family cabin. No spouses, no children, no significant others, no common law whatevers. Just the core group, the cousins themselves. And they all came, each year, unencumbered by whatever families they'd accumulated. Mostly because they missed each other, and the cabin, but also because Ginny was relentless, a bump toy who cajoled and pestered and circled back until each and every one of them committed to attend each year. It was she who came up with the idea of a theme for the weekend. Not only that, but she chose the theme, got all the props, designed all the events. She is a creative as well as exhaustless person. Over the years there had been a Hawaiian weekend, a Vegas theme, a trip to Japan, Paul Bunyan Lumberjack, and others. All they had to do was show up. And they had. But then the pandemic had interrupted the tradition, causing the cancellation of the trip for two years, and threatening the tenuous continuity that kept it going. It might have died there, but Ginny May was not a woman who was deterred easily. That third summer, with the pandemic still ebbing and flowing, but people creeping out, trying to rejoin life, she announced the adult gathering in a new theme and began, pushing, circling around, and pushing again. And they were all, finally, corralled. First back to the cabin for the themed weekend, and then to this final bonfire at the end of it. Though the weekend was in September, she'd chosen what she called a Victorian Halloween theme. There was orange and black, in streamers and tablecloths and napkins, but also pumpkin carving, bobbing for apples, a costume contest, and, on Saturday night, a ghost storytelling session with brandy and cigars, as in the gentlemen's dens of old. Except, there being no gentlemen's den, and half the gentlemen being women, they would hold this session around the fire pit in the backyard of the cabin, under the stars. And so after dinner, after the dishes were washed by the losers of the traditional lottery, they gathered round the fire pit, and Ginny brought out brandy and plastic glasses and cigars and cellophane wrappers. Only she and Pamela, Patrick and Patricia's daughter, partook of the cigars, the rest of them politely declining. Some of them had to have the gentleman's den, brandy, cigars, ghost story connection explained to them, but even if they grasped the concept, it did not make them more enthusiastic about the cigars. They did lay into the brandy with enthusiasm, though. Alice, who had won the costume contact with a 20s flapper theme, still wore hers, but the rest of them had slipped into something more comfortable and warm. Michael, always Michael, never Mike, even when they were younger, and 15 years older than the rest of them, did smoke, but it was his pipe, 
less in solidarity with the cigar smokers than because he always smoked his pipe. They all sat in their mismatched lawn chairs around the fire. Ginny hadn't even expected Michael to show up. In his early forties now, he'd always been much older than the rest of them, a bit out of place, out of sync. Not an uncle, but not quite an equal. His mother, Sarah, also mother to Trey and Joni, 25 and 26, had suffered a contraception malfunction at 16, run away with Michael's father, and returned home with the boy, bruised and cynical and angry, long before any of the other siblings had even married. He'd always been slightly above their childish games, though relegated to them. He had, though, attended all the new cousin reunion weekends, but participated no more than he had when they were young. He didn't wear the Hawaiian shirt during that weekend, or try his hand at origami, or dress like a lumberjack, or carve a pumpkin. He puffed his pipe and observed, not hostile, but with an amused interest, the younger cousin's antics. That's why, after Pam told the story everybody had already heard a hundred times about a shadow she'd seen on her dorm room wall, which moved, in a room in which a girl had hung herself or slit her wrists or something like that, and Jeremy, Jerbear, Rachel and Jordan's son, who everybody knew was a liar, spun out an incredible tale of a vampire he'd once helped procure victims for, and Ginny had told of Orb showing up on her camera phone, and Trey had said he once got goosebumps every time he walked across a particular spot in his first apartment in Uptown, it was a surprise when Michael said, quietly, with a puff on his pipe, I have a story. The thing is, it doesn't really have an ending, or the ending isn't very satisfying. They stared at him. If you want to hear it. Oh, Michael, Michael. Of course we want to hear it. Please do tell it. Brandy was distributed all around. Michael looked into his red plastic cup, as if he could discern from the look of it that it was not of the finest quality. He seemed to have regret having spoken up. But they were all wrapped. Jonah, Mary and John's son, threw a couple more logs on the fire. The flames lit up the now black forest with undulating, flickering light. Michael tamped his pipe, looked into the bowl, lit it, and looked back at them across the fire for a moment before beginning. This was in 1999, he said. He pulled at his pipe, and getting no result, searched his pockets until he found his matches and relit the bowl. I was living in New York City, New York, he said. I was living in a one-bedroom walk-up two blocks off Soho, and I was dating a goth girl from Indiana. Her name was Suki, or at least that's what I called her, and she was an aficionado of sensational murderers and serial killers. His audience shifted in their mismatched lawn chairs. They looked at the sky or the fire. To make the story short, she'd made contact with an old man in Toronto, Canada, who had a museum of objects related to just such things, some he'd collected, some he'd inherited from his father, who was a magistrate of some kind, court transcripts and a t-shirt worn by so-and-so, and the bite mark cast for somebody, and so on, but his prize exhibit, the cornerstone of his little museum, was a pipe that had been owned by the infamous Dr. Crippen. Ah, cried Ginny, the serial killer of Chicago, the castle of death, the devil in the white city. No, said Michael, no, that would be H.H. H. Holmes. Not him, but Crippen, who poisoned and dismembered his wife and fled to Toronto with his lover, dressed as his son. Wait, said Ginny, who was dressed as the son? The lover, of course. I will admit I knew nothing of those things, but she was a pretty girl, and I took the trip with her up to Toronto to this little museum so she could see a pipe that bore the tooth marks of Dr. Crippen, the murderer. So, this guy in the story, the pipe guy, he just killed the one lady, said Trey, quietly, so as not to seem unsatisfied. Yes, just the one, but it was sensational. The whole story is too long to tell, but the lover, who had disguised herself as his son when they fled to Canada, was dragged back to London with him by Scotland Yard, all because of the invention of the telegraph. And after he was tried and convicted, she was acquitted as an accomplice, inherited all his belongings in his pre-execution will, and fled back for a while to Toronto before returning to London where she remarried. The telegraph? said Ginny uncertainly. Yes. It was a huge technological advancement at the time. Like, like the invention of the internet. Instant, you see? like magic at the time, like a miracle. If not for a telegraph message the ship's crew saw, and the one they sent in response, he and his lover would have walked free and disappeared into the wilds of 1890s Canada. As it was, they were caught at the wharf as the ship landed and taken into custody. This was the provenance, you see. 
That's all that matters in these things. That she'd lived in Toronto for a couple of years following the conviction and, on the eve of her return to England, had given the old man's father some of her lover's effects to lighten her luggage. He already had a collection of things and would collect more later, but this thing, this pipe, with Crippen's tooth marks, was the most famous thing he had. You're right, said Ethan, George and Caroline's son. I'm starting to fear this story really does have no end. Wake me up when the pipe appears. Shh, the rest admonished him, and a bird flew up out of the brush and startled them all. Maybe it was a bat, said Jinny, working tirelessly. This is all by way of explaining how he came to be there, said Michael, unperturbed. We got to the little museum, which was in the front room of this old man's house, and you needed an appointment to see it. There weren't regular hours or anything, but she was very pretty, and she'd charmed him, this old man, and so among the jailhouse confessions written on napkins, and the rusty revolvers dredged out of rivers, and dark bottles of poison still with their peeling labels and brass knuckles and cudgels, was the star of the exhibits, the Crippen Pipe, on a lucite stand in a lucite case. He paused. We have come, he told Ethan, to the pipe. Thank God. So he took the pipe out of the case and he let Suki hold it, and in an instant she'd put it to her lips and sucked, and he let out a cry and snatched it back, for no one since Crippen had put their lips on that mouthpiece in more than a hundred years, and now she had. Just an old tobacco pipe, said Jinny, in wonder. But the thing is, as angry as he was, he was interested. What did you feel? he asked. Nothing, she said. Nothing. He seemed disappointed. Maybe he was charmed. Maybe he'd always hoped something would happen. But he wavered there, looking at us, looking at her. And finally he said, I have something else. I saw Suki's eyes light up. What have you got? she said. The old man snuck a glance at me. I could tell he wished she was alone. There was something else among the effects, he said, slowly. My father got everything, you understand. It was a trunk load of stuff, and she did not want to bring it back. And though she knew very little about this piece I am referring to, it had been important to Crippen. He had saved it, with his homeopathic bottles and jars, and taken it with him on their ill-fated flight on the steamer. It had been given to Crippen, she said, by a retired detective of the Scotland Yard, who was very old at the time and suffering, and grateful to Dr. Crippen's homeopathic ministrations, but unable to pay. Was it, was it another pipe? asked Ethan, a little difficult to decipher because he was deep into the brandy. The other shushed him again, but Michael was unruffled. No, he said, no, it was not. It was a knife. A knife, said Ethan. Now we're getting somewhere. Yes, said Michael, but you see it had no provenance. That's why he couldn't put it in the museum. It had been given to Crippen as an important knife. The London detective who'd given it to him had thought it was an important knife, but it was just a knife in a flimsy old wooden box lined with dirty silk. It was evidence from some other investigation, something important. Michael cast his eyes upward, looking at the constellations now so much brighter since darkness had set in, as if he could see the knife even as he spoke of it. It was old, I will tell you that. The handle was wood, dark from years of use. There were four iron rivets, hand-hammered, the one nearest the blade securing a finger guard to the handle. The blade was rusty, maybe eight inches long, and had been sharpened until it was slightly concave. He puffed his pipe for a moment. Suki knew what it was, he said. She knew instinctively. I could see it in her eyes. And in my own way, I knew, too. I could feel it. I don't know what possessed me, but I had to hold that knife in my hand, feel its handle in my grip. I knew what it was. Just as quickly as Suki had grasped the pipe, I snatched the knife from the old man and gripped the handle, and it was as if a low, dull vibration ran through my hand. I don't get it, said Jinny. What's the knife? Is it important? What knife is it? There's no provenance, said Michael. That's the point. But I can tell you this. It was a knife from a Scotland Yard detective in the 1890s, significant in an important case, and the significance was clear. And then, as quickly as I'd grasped the knife in my hand, Suki had grasped my wrist, put out her other arm, and drawn the blade across her skin. So you're saying, said Ethan slowly, you're claiming, not claiming anything. But you are. You're telling me you held Jack the Ripper's knife. If there was provenance... Ah, said Jinny, Jack the Ripper. 
As I said, there was no provenance, but... But, said Ethan, well, when she did that, and the blood did well up from the cut on her forearm, I felt the vibration increase, like a sound wave rising. And she felt the blade, said Ginny, shivering deliciously. Are you sure it was the knife? His knife? There was no provenance, that's the point. The old man took the knife back, shouted at us to leave, wiped it on the dirty silk and set it back in its box, and called after us as we retreated, Did you get what you came here for, girly? Did you get what you wanted? Okay, said Ethan, but Jack the Ripper was never caught. So how does Scotland Yard have the knife? Jack the Ripper's knife, breathed Jenny. Oh, they knew who it was, said Alice, revealing a knowledge nobody knew she possessed. They knew. He was royalty or something. Big cover-up. I feel like that's tenuous at best, said Ethan. There was no provenance, I told you. I acknowledge that. Michael puffed at his pipe again. Anyway, we drove home in the dark without saying a word to each other, crossed the border in silence, afraid of being stopped. We felt badly about what had happened to the old man. What do you mean, what happened to the old man? I mean he was betrayed. His trust was betrayed. Well, that's kind of an ending, said Ginny. I've heard worse. Michael puffed at his pipe for a moment. Above, the Milky Way revealed itself, a slim spattering of stars across the heavens, invisible in the city. That is not the end. More brandy, said Ethan, and somebody poke up the fire. Poke it up yourself, said Ginny, but she poured him, and herself, another ounce or so. So what happened then? Well, we drove back to the city. Suki was upset, pacing around the flat. We had a few drinks, tried to calm down. I asked her if she felt anything from the knife, and she said no, except that she'd always wondered if she could cut herself. It stings now, she said, if that makes you happy. That seemed to come out of nowhere, but when I look back now, it seems like that was the beginning of the end of us. Why? I don't know. It just seemed so, in retrospect. Maybe it was the guilt. You think you aren't capable of such a thing. We knew what we had done. I don't think either of us had thought we were capable. Geez, said Trey, so you touched his precious stuff. Doesn't seem like that big a deal to me. That wasn't all. We went to bed that night, and I kept thinking of the look on her face as she'd sliced the knife blade across her arm. I couldn't sleep. My dreams were terrible, violent, cruel. I woke, horrified, and could barely breathe. I rolled over, shook Suki to wake her, tell her of my nightmare, and what turned over was not... I swear, Suki. The face was sliced and destroyed, the nose was missing, the hair was ratted and matted with blood, and the gap-toothed mouth opened silently, agonizingly, but there was no tongue. I screamed and leaped from the bed. Suki screamed, and in that instant it was her again, and jumped out of bed too. And I could not describe to her what I had seen, not just because of the terror of it, but because for the first few seconds after she leaped from the bed, her eyes were still its eyes a completely different color. Holy crap, said Ethan. Indeed. Anyway, it didn't work out with her. It was many years ago. Now she's got a law degree from Harvard, works for a big firm in Manhattan, and probably makes four million dollars a year. And then he sat, smoking his pipe, and the cousins contemplated the fire, or the dark woods around them, or the speckled band of the Milky Way above, and thought perhaps of their own mortality, and the last night of another cousin's weekend drew to a close. The fire died down. One by one, they drifted into the cabin and their lumpy bunks. All but Ethan, who had one last thought. As the cousins headed off to bed, he went down to the kitchen. It took him a minute or two of digging through the drawers to find it, the filleting knife Michael had brought up to the cabin one year way back when the rest of them were children, claiming it was the best he'd ever owned. It had struck Ethan odd even at the time, Michael did not seem like the kind of guy to put that much wear on a filleting knife, or to spend much time fishing. The thing is, at that moment in his life, Ethan had been somewhat infatuated with Michael, who seemed impossibly worldly and cool. It hadn't looked like a great filleting knife at all, and when Ethan had said as much to his father, a skilled fisherman, his father, distracted by something else as usual, had said, Consider the possibility that your cousin is full of crap. Ethan held it in his hand now, battered, the rivets rusted, the blade sharpened concave. He felt nothing. He hadn't looked at it in twenty years. 
Not only had he never seen Michael use it, he had never seen him sharpen it or let anyone else sharpen it either. Eventually it ended up in one of the junk drawers, forgotten. It bothered Ethan, this knife left in such a state, whatever it was. He got the whetstone out and began sharpening the long, curved blade. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught a glimmer, movement. It was Ginny, still awake as well, standing in the shadows in the kitchen doorway, the light reflected in the lenses of her glasses. It occurred to him that she, too, might have made the connection to the fillet knife Michael had shown up with all those years ago. For a moment she hesitated. Then she advanced, slowly, saying nothing, as he continued to sharpen the knife. The End